Hi, welcome back. In this section, we'll cover window ranking functions. With these types of functions, we can apply a certain rank to each value within an ordered window. The first function we'll start with is the row number window function. To explain and demonstrate how this function works, we'll be using the Chinook database. In the results tab, we have the contents of the track table, which is a table we'll be querying throughout this video. This table stores data about all the tracks we have in our system. So let's take a look at the first query. Here we have implemented the row number window function. As I stated during the slides, there are two things important to us when using window functions. The first one is the computation or function. And the second one is the window specification. The row number function applies a sequential rank, starting at one for each value within an ordered window or partition. The window specification for this function is the descending order of the milliseconds column. Because we've used the descending sort direction, the track with the highest duration will be ranked first, while the track with the lowest duration will be ranked last. Let's execute this statement to better understand how this function works. The longest track, which is ranked first, has a duration of about 5300 seconds. If we scroll down to the last row in the result set, you'll see that the shortest track has a duration of about one second. Let's break down what happened here. The row number function generated numbers, starting from one, and incremented one for each row until it reached the last row. During the slides, we looked at an example where the window is the entire column for each row, but with ranking functions. These types of windows cannot be implemented. The window of each row for these types of functions starts at the first row in the data set and ends at the current row. So, if the first row is the current row, the window of this row will contain only one row, because there is only one row between the first and the current row. If we move to the second row, then this row becomes the current row. The window of the second row starts at the first and ends at the current row, which means the row has a window containing two rows. The third row has a bigger window because there are three rows between the first and the current row, and this is the same principle that continues for each row. So basically, the window of each row increases by one, till we reach the last row in the data set. If we change the sorting direction to ascending and execute this query, we'll get a different result. You'll now notice that the tracks with the shortest duration are ranked first, while the tracks with the longest duration are ranked last. An important thing to note is the order in which the data is displayed. In this example, the order is based on the ascending order of the milliseconds column, but this is not a guarantee. This is only a guarantee for the context or window of the function, but not for the result set. So, if you need to have the result in a specific order, do not count on the window specification. Add an explicit order by clause to ensure it is in the order as required. One of the most practical implementations of the row number function is pagination. As we've previously seen, we have about 3,503 tracks in the track table. Querying and displaying them all at the same time in client applications might not be the best move in terms of performance. A better way would be to query the data in sections only when the user requests it. So, what we'll do next is implement pagination using the row number window function and a common table expression. The common table expression returns the following result. Here we have the window ordered ascending by the track ID column. Since the track ID column is an identity column, and we have deleted no rows, the row number should be the same as the track ID. Once we retrieve the result from the common table expression, we filter the data based on the row number column. By using these predicates, we only get the rows where the row number is greater than zero and less than or equal to 10. If we execute this query, we should get a result set of 10 rows. This represents the first page of 10 rows. If we want to retrieve the second page, we can change these numbers to 10 and 20. When we execute this query, we'll have retrieved the second page. So this is how we can implement pagination using the row number function. But this is not dynamic. If I want to get the next 10 rows or the third page, I would need to change the query. So this goes for every page I want to retrieve. So to fix this, I've implemented the query using a stored procedure. This stored procedure accepts two parameters of which the second one is optional. The first parameter named start determines the first row of each page. Well, the second parameter determines the total number of rows that will be displayed on each page. The default value is 10. If you look at the body of the stored procedure, you'll notice the query is pretty similar to what we've seen earlier. 
However, instead of working with literal values, we're working with variables to make the pagination solution dynamic. Let's go ahead and create this procedure. When we invoke the procedure using the following parameters, we get a page with the first 10 tracks based on the ascending order of the track ID column. So the stored procedure returned all the tracks from the track table, where the row number is greater than 0 and less than or equal to 0 plus 10, which is the same we've seen earlier. If we want to get the second page, we can simply set the value for the start parameter to 10. So now, we no longer need to change the query if we want to select another page. If we need to change the total number of rows on each page, we can simply pass in a value for the step parameter. Let's say on each page we need a total of 20 rows instead of the default, which is 10. Once we execute this procedure, we get a result set with the first 20 rows, basically the first page. If we want to get the second page, we can change the 0 to 20 and execute this procedure. As you can see, we're now looking at the second page, which goes up to the 40th row. All the queries we've covered so far have been about a single window. Let's take a look at the next query. This query uses the partition by clause to partition the window, which is the track ID column ordered ascending into smaller partitions based on the name column. As a result, the row number function will compute a sequential number for each row in each partition. When we execute the query, we get the following result. The first thing you'll notice is that almost all rows have a row number of 1. Let's try and understand what happened here. The row number function computes a sequential row number for each row within a partition and restarts when it reaches a new one. The partitions are groups of rows that have the same value for the partition column, which is the name column. So this is the first partition, this is the second partition, this is the third partition, and so it goes on until we reach the last partition. Since all these songs have unique names, these partitions have only one row, hence the row number of one. However, some song names appear multiple times. For example, two minutes to midnight. There are five occurrences of this name in the name column. As a result, the row number function computes a sequential row number for each row in this partition with respect to the order by clause. This is the reason we have ranks of one, two, three, four, and five assigned to these rows. This is helpful because it helps us determine whether there are tracks with duplicate or similar names. This is where the CTE in this filter comes in. Any row where the row number is greater than one means the partition the row is part of has multiple rows, which means there are multiple occurrences of that name. Let's execute the complete query to see the result. So these are all the tracks with names that occur more than once. If we look at the first partition, you'll notice the row number goes up to five. However, we've only retrieved four of the five occurrences. That's because we filtered the result set using the following condition which effectively retrieves all songs with the same name, except for the first occurrence. This is the reason we started at two and have only four rows in this partition. The next thing we'll look at is finding the top end results for each partition. In this example, we'll be getting the longest song for each album. The CTE returns the following result. For each row in a partition, the row number function computes a sequential number, but when it reaches a new partition, the number restarts. This can be seen when the album ID changes. So this is the first partition or the first album with a total of 10 songs. These songs are ordered descending by the milliseconds column, which means the longest song is ranked first. This goes for all partitions. If we now execute the complete query, we get the following result. By filtering using this predicate, we now have the longest song for each album. This is also an implementation that is quite frequently used, especially when getting the top three recent orders of each customer. So in this video, we've covered how to use the row number window function, and we've also looked at some practical implementations of this function. That's it for this lecture. In the next video, we'll cover the rank and dense rank window function. Thank you for watching. See you then.